of the state constitution. And I want to talk a little bit about just that tonight. Um, and of course, I've got a big learning curve to get through because what I'm going to tell you is that uh, one, Ohio has a constitution. Two, it's actually really great on paper. Three, it's actually really under attack by the legal class that's uh, running our judgeships all over the state. But four, that there's a way that you can do things to fight back against that. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of those things. And we're going to talk about each of those things in pretty great detail. So, so the thesis of my talk is really that um, you know, many of our federal constitutional rights were eviscerated during the New Deal era. Uh, and this is, the, this is the product of the progressive philosophy uh, implemented really by, by FDR, envisioned by Woodrow Wilson beforehand, who appointed many progressive judges to the bench, who eventually um, turned over the, the keys to government, really to the legislators and to majority rule and to the administrative agencies instead of to the Constitution. And I, I think that I told you this story the last time I was down here about how that happened case by case. So I don't want to go through that too much, but, but as, as much as the federal Constitution has been redacted, what we do have is a really tremendous Ohio Constitution on paper as another way to protect your rights. And this is critical because a lot of you um, may know this, but some of you may not. Many of the things that you interface with on a daily basis, many of your most fundamental rights are really matters of state law. Property rights, for example, are almost always determined at the state level. Uh, property rights are state issues. Contract rights are state issues. Um, most of your taxes are actually state and local taxes, and they're determined by the Ohio Constitution. So uh, it's really important to know what's in this document and also to take these issues very, very seriously. So, uh, why is the Ohio Constitution so great? Let me start with a, a quick story that I think helps explain that. Um, and it's a story from here in Cincinnati. A gentleman uh, from Norwood, Ohio, actually. How many of you remember the Kelo versus New London case? Raise your hand if you remember that case. Kelo versus New London, the 30-second explanation. This is a case the, the United States Supreme Court decided in 2004 the crux of the decision was that the takings clause in the federal constitution in the Fifth Amendment did not prohibit the Pfizer Corporation from lobbying the local government, New London, Connecticut, from taking a woman's home, taking, <clears throat> kicking her out of the home, bulldozing it, and giving it to the Pfizer Corporation to build a headquarters there, because doing so would increase the tax base for the local government. And uh, this probably resonates with a bunch of you we start to feel like uh, tax brain is really the, the, the holy grail of local government anymore. Everything they do is to, to raise tax revenue rather than to protect your rights. So this really resonated with people. And the notion that you could be booted out of your home in favor of a private corporation was really quite shocking. And so the, the court found the Fifth Amendment didn't protect this, uh, didn't protect this woman's property rights or her home. Well, one year later, fast forward to Ohio, and a gentleman named Joe Horney out of Norwood, Ohio, brought the exact same claim in the Ohio Supreme Court. And in the exact same kind of case, the Ohio Supreme Court indicated that the takings clause in the Ohio Constitution, even though it was written almost identical to the Fifth Amendment, was more protective of your property rights than the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution. So while this Kilo lost her house using the federal constitution to protect her rights. Mr. Orney got to keep his house because he chose to use the state constitution to protect his rights. So, so there's a lot you can do with this document, even when the language is very similar. Um, and the notion is one, it's sometimes called Brennan federalism because Justice Brennan in the United States Supreme Court, even though he's considered to the left, talked about this concept a lot. It's the notion that the federal constitution provides a baseline level of protection for your rights. Say it's here. State constitutions can go above and beyond this baseline level and provide different protections of rights and more protections of rights. So this is, and oftentimes they do on their face through different provisions that you would never see in the federal constitution um, and through interpretations by judges 
that are in fact broader and more protective than what's in the federal constitution. Um, and, and really, I, I referenced this New Deal era where many of our uh, most precious constitutional rights were destroyed by the New Deal court, never to really be found again. Um, Ohio had a backlash against this. So if you look at the uh, Ohio Supreme Court cases in the 1940s, you see uh, lots of wonderful language noting that if the federal government uh, is not going to protect your rights, that we can use the Ohio Constitution to do so. So the Ohio judges were very much aware of what was going on at the time at the federal level, aware of the rescission of the federal constitution, and, and I think the exact quote was uh, from a case called Direct Plumbing in 1944. If in this time of regimentation of persons and property, the federal constitution does not provide protection, we must remember that Ohio is a sovereign state and has its own constitution with its own protections. And, and this predicate is really why we started the 1851 Center, to uh, aggressively use the Ohio Constitution. Um, the 1851 Constitution came about in a time where, does anybody know what precipitated the 1851 Constitution? If you know the answer to this, I'm going to give you my last pocket Ohio Constitution. Anybody? Um, well, it was, uh, it was actually bailouts of businesses who were too big to fail. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Uh, these, uh, these canal and railroad companies were um, getting public funds to do, to do their work, and they got in a little bit deep, and so uh, the government said, look, they've supplied too many jobs. These are huge businesses. Everybody works for them. Everybody doesn't work for them, is invested in them. We can't possibly allow these canal and railroad companies to go belly up. So um, they, they borrowed money, gave it to the companies, had to tax Ohioans in order to pay off the debts. And uh, the notion was, look, it's probably not right to take from A and give to B, so let's devise a state constitution that protects against that. And this constitution very much does so. So um, to, to illustrate that, I'm going to share a few provisions with you. And I'm going to be using my pocket constitution, which I shamelessly plugged the need to print more of moments ago. Um, and, and it starts right at the beginning. The, the state constitution reads more like the Declaration of Independence than the federal constitution, and really acknowledges some very fundamental things that are, are very unique, very broad, very important, and often overlooked. So the, the preamble to the Ohio constitution begins, we the people of the state of Ohio Grateful to Almighty God for our freedom to secure its blessings, do ordain this Constitution. So right there, we've got something that we don't have anywhere in the federal Constitution. We have the notion that our, our rights are not, they do not come from the legislature, they do not come from John Kasich, they do not come from an administrative agency, they do not come from Barack Obama, they don't come from another man. Our rights are inherent in our humanity. This is natural rights theory, and this is uh, what's called Lockean. And spaces. So Locke was kind of the, the father of, uh, of the natural rights philosophy, the notion that your rights are inalienable. They, they come from your creator, and no other man can take those rights away from you. So the Ohio Constitution acknowledges that natural rights theory, which, which really is of ultimate importance when you're talking about the political philosophy that drives our, our community and our state. Um, and then if you look at section one, article, the very first section of the Bill of Rights, and here's something else that's unique. So the Bill of Rights, how many amendments to the Bill of Rights, anybody? 10, how many in the Ohio Bill of Rights? 21, 21, more than twice as many. Um, section one, article one, all men are by nature free and independent and have certain inalienable rights among which are those of enjoying and defending life and liberty, acquiring, possessing, and protecting property, and seeking and obtaining happiness and safety. So again, we've got kind of a natural rights theory here, the, the explicit protection of your property rights, the acknowledgement that you're born free, and that you should be free to the maximum extent possible, right at the beginning of the Ohio Constitution. And we see early Ohio Supreme Court cases interpreting citizens' rights in Ohio extremely broadly. 
basically saying that any any regulation that deprives you of any ounce of your liberty has to be absolutely necessary. If anybody's really a junkie for this stuff, the 1896 case called Palmer v. Tingle just goes on and on and says, look, liberty is a very meaningful thing that we can define. We can tell you exactly what liberty means. It means freedom to exercise one's faculties in any way one so wishes, as long as it doesn't harm another person in the process. And to take away, to take away that kind of freedom, you've got to have a compelling justification. So it's the kind of analysis that we only see in First Amendment analysis today, uh, unfortunately, but that we, but is entirely consistent with uh, the first section of the Ohio Constitution. The second section of the Ohio Constitution actually allows you to abolish your government. Did you know that? Actually says that. It says uh, <coughs> Ohio, all political power resides in the people, and they are free to alter, revoke, or abolish their government whenever they see fit, and there also should be no special privileges granted to any particular group. So uh, imagine we had no special privileges clause in the federal constitution. Uh, that almost everything that they've legislated in the last uh, four, eight, 16 years would be unconstitutional, right? So really remarkable and, and occasionally violated, um, and we're gonna talk about why as we go along. And uh, this actually has teeth in some ways. So for example, there's a, uh, a village government um, called Tremont City uh, outside of Springfield, and we're actually putting a, an initiative on to abolish that government. There's actually provisions in the Ohio Constitution and in Ohio statutes for you to put, um, to put on the ballot an issue of whether to surrender the corporate powers of a particular community. Um, and it's easiest to use with village governments, which is less than uh, 3,000 people. So this, this village went, uh, has, has 250 people living in it, has 16 full-time police officers, um, <laughs> and uh, just implemented a 1% income tax on the people who live there, and also a law that, that you cannot feed the cats during daytime hours, which really upset a few, a few of people, a little old ladies in the village. So we're helping them eliminate their government in the process of eliminating this 1% tax and also save them from getting so many speeding tickets when they're coming home to their, their little village at night. So this has application. Section 4 of the Ohio Constitution um, protects your right to bear arms and your right to self-defense. And uh, a lot of everybody's, not everybody, but a lot of people heard of the Heller decision in the United States Supreme Court in 2008 affirming your right to bear arms as an individual right. Well, Ohio had that same decision uh, called Arnold v. Cleveland in 1994, so a full 14 years ahead of the Heller decision, much less publicized, but your right to bear arms was safe in Ohio under the Ohio Constitution already. Uh, Section 11 of the Ohio, Ohio Constitution, we're still in the Bill of Rights, is the right to free speech, but it's actually much broader than the First Amendment. It's the right to freely speak your sentiments anytime you may wish and not be subject to punishment for it. Section 16 is the right to sue, the right to access to courts. Um, and then, of course, Section 21, we now have the Health Care Freedom Amendment. Um, the Ohio Constitution also prohibits certain things, the General Assembly from doing certain things when legislating. They're not anywhere in the federal constitution. For example, uh, a single subject rule is in the Ohio Constitution, which indicates that every bill has to be one subject and one subject only. So again, just imagine if we had this in the federal constitution, that again, there would be no legislation, right? Now, again, this is sometimes violated today by our General Assembly, and citizens wonder why, and I think I'm gonna be able to tell you that. Um, Ohio uh, has a uniformity clause, which requires that all legislation passed be of a general nature and apply uniformly throughout the state. And this, along with the single subject rule, was passed, and if you remember your civics class, you may have heard the term log rolling. So the idea is that you would uh, you would have something that's popular and then you would attach riders to it that are unpopular, things that we call earmarks, for example, today, right? So this was basically to prevent earmarks. Um, you would have only one subject, and, and the thing has to be uniform. So you can't pass an omnibus bill writing for a post office over here, or you know, the, the Robert Byrd Highway to Westchester. Um, somewhere else. So again, just imagine we had these things at the federal level. Um, Article 8 of the Ohio Constitution is really, I think, one of the more remarkable sec uh, articles. And what that does is prevent corporate welfare. And I think this is actually worth quoting because 
How many of you support the bailouts of the banks and the auto companies? Raise your hands if you love those. <laughs> well, think about those bailouts, and then think about the language in Article 8 of the Ohio Constitution, which was passed specifically to prescribe similar bailouts by the state. This is Section 4. The credit of the state shall not in any manner be given or loaned to or in aid of any individual association or corporation or whatever, nor shall the state ever hereafter become a joint owner or stockholder in any company or association in the state or elsewhere formed for any purpose whatsoever. Pretty remarkable because uh, so much of what the federal government does is subsidize private business through one way or another. Um, and of course, we're embarking on that course here in Ohio. We've been dabbling in it for a while, and it's uh, going to pick up steam uh, pretty soon. But these are all things that the framers of the 1851 Constitution sought to prohibit. Um, and the section before that, you may be interested to know, guess what Ohio's debt limit is? So remember the debt ceiling debate at the federal level? What's, what's, the, what's the level of permissible debt held by the federal government? <coughs> Whatever they want. It's, it's whatever they want. The Constitution says nothing about the amount of debt uh, the federal government can hold. And of course, they have banking powers, which are prohibited under the Ohio Constitution by the state. But uh, Ohio's debt limit is $750,000. You probably have neighbors here in Westchester with their homes that are under $750,000. So that, that was in the 1851 Constitution. It's never been changed. It's still 750000 So what that means is that when the legislature uh, creates a new budget, which they do every two years, it has to be a balanced budget. So that's where the balanced budget requirement comes from, is they've got to be within 750k of where they need to be, um, because they can't borrow the money. They've got, they've got to tax or not spend it. Um, Article uh, Article 12 requires that you can't be taxed on your property at greater than 1% of the value of your property uh, without a vote. So that's pretty helpful. You've got a tax cap in there. And then, uh, of course, two things that really invigorate the process are the initiative and referendum, which are in Article 2, Section 1, and the ability to elect your judges, which is in Article 4. So. With those provisos about all the great things that I think are in the Ohio Constitution, it's probably worth talking about what's going on with those great things. If those things are so great, why don't we live in a utopia? Um, and the answer to that is that very few of you um, and very few people in general pay attention to who their judges are or what those people are up to. 